see you today and uh, really appreciate you taking time away from whatever you're doing. Um, you know, in, in my uh, heart, I believe that this is probably one of the most important uh, talks or, or lectures you'll attend because this is about you. And all of the technologies that we have, all the expertise that we have, all of that is um, helps patients, but we can't help the patients if we can't stay in the lab and we can't be comfortable there and we can't be safe there. And so uh, so this is really about, about you and, and please feel free to ask questions as we go along. We have uh, assembled just an incredible group of people that are, are going to kind of take us down uh, this walk and this journey on radiation safety and, and orthopedic safety and the cath lab, just basically making our workspace safer, which we, we have got to do and, and it's time. The reason that we're doing it now is because this is World Day for Safety and Health at Work. and um, and I think it's a, it's a great time to recognize that. I think for too long, it's been ignored. And, uh, and I think you'll hear our speakers kind of reiterate that, that it's time to do something, do something different. Now, the way that we've, uh, we've organized, we'll uh, walk through the talks and, uh, and we have, if you will, you have a question and answer button there, please uh, hit that at any time. And, uh, and those will be fielded by Tanea Metters. She is our VP of Clinical Sales at Rampart. And, um, and so she will be able to either uh, handle those questions, bring them to the panel. Uh, so feel free to do that. And as well, uh, there'll be an active chat room uh, going on. So please have that up so you can kind of see uh, any chat and any discussion that's kind of going on in the chat room. One of the things we found at, uh, at Rampart is that um, we want to be educational and and we need to, uh, we have a long way to go. People just don't know about the environment that they work in. And the deeper that we can dive into that, I think the better. And that's what this, uh, this next hour to hour and a half is really gonna show us is, is bringing these experts to, together and, uh, and not only telling their experiences, but also educating us on, um, on our health risks. Um, do you want to put it, put a big uh, uh, shout out to uh, Shauna Walsh? She's our Rampart International team. She has heard of the cats, and she has uh, she's brought some incredible cats here, which you'll see. Um, these are these are the world experts, and uh, can't wait to hear from them. So, with that, uh, hopefully everybody is now on board and ready to go. And if you um, if you'll um, I will say that, uh, that this is the team and I'll introduce them as we go along uh, so that we don't take much, uh, much more time away, but, uh, but they're from uh, literally all over the world. And, um, and that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna uh, bring to light. Um, Tanae, again, she's gonna, she's gonna field the questions. And so please, uh, please bring those uh, to us so that we can have those, so we can answer those. Again, this is for you. Um, I do want to mention briefly ORSIF, which you'll see more of that coming out. It's a organization for occupational radiation safety. It's a nonprofit that we are hopefully bringing resources together for you to have access on what's going on in the world and, and radiation safety. What are uh, ways that you can protect yourself? Um, kind of have a, a unified resource that you can go to. We also are supporting uh, Professor Spratt and the um, and Optima. Uh, they're going to put a series of modules together on radiation safety, which you'll see those start coming out in, into this throughout this year uh, to the end of the year. And, and I would uh, highly recommend uh, all of you know, and he'll be um, here with us today, but, um, but all of you know, he's just a, a great communicator. He's going to teach us a lot about um, about the environment that we work in and how we can how we can protect ourselves as well. Well, this is where I lived for uh, almost 30 years and absolutely loved it. It was my passion. I know many of you who are listening today, this is your passion as well. And this is where you want to be and this is where you want to stay. And you cannot imagine doing your uh, job without being in the lab with your team and taking care of patients. Um, this is what uh, this is what we love. 
and this is where we want to stay. And this is, uh, to be honest, where I thought that I would be my entire career. Um, what I didn't realize is that uh, that where we work is a very uh, dangerous place, both from the orthopedic risks of wearing the lead all day long, uh, but also we get more we get more radiation than any other uh, occupation. And the effects of that you'll see um, in some uh, in some of the talks coming up. And so um, so with this, and it's not just us, you know, it's our team as well. We kind of feel like as leaders in the lab that we we really should be the ones protecting our team as well and be their voice, uh, speak loudly and, and try to get everyone the best protection that they possibly can, both from an orthopedic and a, and a radiation uh, safety perspective. Um, one of the things that Thomas Edison said is don't talk to me about x-rays, I'm afraid of them. And um, and, you know, to be honest, I knew about radiation, uh, but I just wasn't that afraid of them. I felt like, you know, smarter people than me probably knew that if I just put on this lead apron that I'd be protected and uh, and I'd be I'd be fine. Um, but the reason that he was so scared of them is because his right hand man, if you will, uh, Clarence Daly, um, he he showed that you could see through the body using X-rays used his right hand for most of these testing, uh, as you can see in the slide. Ultimately, he, uh, he had severe radiation uh, damage to his hand, ultimately cancer of his hand, lost his hand, lost his arm, and ultimately died of, of his radiation exposure. And this is likely the first American to die from the effects of the uh, experimental radiation. So, so he kind of moved on from there. Um, this is my story. This is my damage. Uh, and I don't know what effects radiation has had on me um, yet. You know, that's uh, that's to be found maybe later and praying that that's not the case. But what did happen to me is a disc rupture. And uh, and with that had a lot of uh, a lot of issues with that. And it wasn't uh, wasn't really that I don't consider myself that old. But uh, but, you know, the first one hit when I was in my 40s. And, um, and after, after that, I took a little time, time away, had a back surgery, and then slowly increased my caseload over the next year or two back up to normal. And I uh, thought, uh, thought that I was okay at that point, that it had been fixed, and then had a second disruption, this one much larger. Um, that's the one I showed you and created um, a complete paralysis of my leg. Wasn't able to walk for a while. Took several uh, months of rehab just to be able to walk, and then um, and was out of the lab for a year, and then ultimately uh, that's when I began to seek: Are there solutions out there that I can get it back into the lab? The um, orthopedic surgeon said, "You you cannot wear that light apron again," and uh, and I really felt like I had kept myself in pretty good shape. I was a you know triathlete, cycling, running, doing everything that I can that, uh, you know, it's not going to happen to me, but, uh, but in reality, the chances of it happening to you are, are actually pretty high. And so, um, so it's one of those things that we need to look for, uh, not only understanding and dive deeper into the understanding, because I'm not sure that we really have a full grasp of it, but, but also uh, look for solutions. And, uh, and hopefully that's what this will do is, is, is help you understand it, but also begin to look for solutions. You know, it, it's time really to reduce your occupational risk and your team's occupational risk. And, and I really think that these hazards uh, in the lab are really should not have to be part of the job. I think that uh, there's new technologies there that need to be uh, looked into and an opportunity there that we can make the lab a safer place and allow us to deliver these really advanced techniques and procedures and skill levels that uh, that many of you have to take care of patients. It's ultimately a patient safety issue because you're not keeping the best of the best hands in the in the lab. Um, so uh, with that, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to actually have a uh, poll questions as we go along. And so you'll see that uh, you'll see that pop up. And as those uh, pop up, then um, then just kind of uh, take those, and and that way we have kind of a, a feel for um, for what is um, 
what is the audience's understanding of what is your level of understanding regarding radiation exposure uh, in the cath lab? Uh, do you feel like you know, you're comfortable with it? So everybody vote and we'll get the results here in just a minute. Um, but, um, but do you really feel like you know a lot about it? You really researched it. That's why you're on this call. Or are you just seeking to get a little bit more, a um, little bit more understanding? I know from uh, from my standpoint, uh, I started out very much a novice in the understanding, and um, you know, would when I wore my badge, I would uh, I would you know turn it in and get results and realize I'd gotten too much radiation, and then and then uh, try to try to make some changes to avoid that. But one thing I couldn't avoid was um, was the issue uh, with the orthopedic issue. So uh, the good thing is, is that I do think there has been based on this, at least the participants, um, we've got uh, we've got many here that have a very solid understanding. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this group of panels. I think they'll take us a little bit further. The reason why we asked this first is because the first um, speaker, uh, Steve Studerman, um, Steve is an expert. He's a medical physicist at Scripps uh, in San Diego. And so he's going to uh, come to us, kind of uh, teach us a little bit more from a physicist standpoint so that we can dive a little deeper. I thought that that was uh, very important to bring this up um, first, because um, as you can see, there's many that are either uh, solid or experts. And uh, let's bring a true, uh, a true expert that does this every day um to speak to us uh, steve good morning thanks for the introduction yeah i've been in uh, medical physics for about over 30 years now you know there's a lot of changes um in those 30 years you know we start out with big image intensifiers in a film and uh much higher doses and you know as the equipment evolves our image quality is improving our uh, doses are getting uh, lower um so it's always evolving. One of the things that hasn't evolved as much in those last 30 years is how we protect ourselves in the cath labs. Um, so we're gonna talk some about that. And you know, part of the importance of working in the cath labs is understanding your equipment. As the equipment evolves, we have uh, different modes of operation. You know, now most labs hopefully are using pulse modes and low frame rates and, um, you know, using some of the technologies that the different vendors provide. So it's important that the staff understand the equipment and know what they're doing. Um, oops, sorry, I didn't realize that was on my first slide. So we can see the equipment's evolving over the years. Um, and it's important, like I said, as you get new equipment and you understand how to operate it, sometimes the docs don't get enough time to spend with the vendors to learn it, but you know, you want to be able to understand where we can see these different dose indicators. We got DAP values, air kerma values, dose rates. You know, these aren't typically patient doses, but it can help indicate when we get up to a radiation level where we may start seeing maybe skin injuries and stuff like that. And try and, you know, adjust our technique maybe to uh, a little bit lower dose. As we lower patient dose, we're lowering our staff dose and whoever else is in the room. You know, so we want to minimize radiation effects. We get stochastic effects, which are happen by chance. These are the chances of it happens proportional to the dose. And these effects are cancer, hereditary changes. So those, you know, in stochastic effects, we may not see for years later. Some can be five years, 10 years, 30 years. Um, so they have different uh, latency periods. So we can try and minimize those doses. And that's you know, a lot of that will help uh, our staff and our patients. And the other big one is deterministic effects. These have threshold doses. So once we hit a certain threshold, we're going to see a skin injury or hair loss and then cataracts for the operators or even the patients. But, you know, cataracts are typically more concerned with our staff and the physicians. So those ones we can try and prevent and manage by using good radiation safety practices. You know, we have the Alara principles that everyone should know, time, distance, and shielding. Some of these, you know, time, we got to be based on the procedure. Distance, we can't typically move too far back from the procedure table. And then our standard method of shielding and protecting the staff and is uh, lead aprons. So those things that are basic ones, you know, 
we haven't evolved these that much until the last couple of years. You know, thyroid shields, lead glasses, lead aprons, wearing your dose similar to track your radiation dose. Those are our current standards in the cath labs. Um, you know, we can see the different cath labs come with uh, table aprons, lead drapes. And they vary from vendor to vendor. Some are fairly small, some have some little side shields. So those are our current options. And then we also have drop down shields that come from the ceiling that when used properly, if people are using good uh, radiation safety practices, they gotta help minimize the dose. And then, um, you know, a lot of labs use portable shields for staff that on table side to give them a little extra protection. And then as we evolve, we've gotten some new options, these um, zero gravity type leads where, you know, this is typically for the physician doing the procedure. Uh, it takes the weight off of them, but they're, they're pretty big and bulky and it only allows for that one uh, physician to have that and then the rest are wearing this standard lead. And there's different pads that they have available that have attenuating material in them that help uh, one physician properly can reduce the scatter radiation, but then if they're used improperly, they could be in the beam, which actually can increase the dose to everyone. So these can be used and be uh, beneficial when used properly. And then we have some other options where they have side shields that come up to help reduce scatter. So these are some of the current ones that are out there and in use now. And then one of the alternatives we have is the rampart shield. Um, when we first were introduced to this uh, over a year ago at our facility, um, you know, I've, myself and my other physicists, we were a little apprehensive, to be honest. We weren't sure, you know, you've seen the pictures of it. It's like, how's this actually gonna work? But, you know, when we ended up doing a trial and then actually have quite a few of these in our system, when you look at it, it provides substantial shielding. We have one millimeter lead equivalent uh, acrylic panels. These, um, curtains that hang down over the patient of 0.5 millimeter. And most of these are doubled. So they kind of lay in overlap. So you get really good protection when positioned in the, the shielding here. So when we brought these into um, our facility, we did a trial. The Rampart team was great coming in to do training on um, setup and positioning. And um, also we used real time dosimeters to um, put on the staff on the shielded side of it. And then we also um, put one on the other side of the shield so we could compare. We found that we had great attenuation up in the high 98, 98, 99% most cases and um, got real-time dose, uh, dose readings for the staff on the shielded side. And during the trial, myself and my other physicists were in with our handheld meters doing uh, measurements to compare the uh, real-time dosimeters that they were using with our measurements and we found uh, great comparisons and they were really close and felt really comfortable with it. So that's the rampart, you know, and I had my slides out of order, but um, one of the great things with the rampart too is it has a really long and big um, table drape compared to, you know, some of the standard drapes that we saw on previous slide and here, it really provides a lot of protection. Um, and when positioned with the rampart here, it gives us a lot of uh, protection to the staff in the lower extremities and uh, gives us that uh, dose saving. So when we're working without a lead, we're getting protection from head to toe. You know, when we're wearing a typical lead apron, we get you know, our torso is covered if we have a thyroid shield, the lead glasses on, but the rest of our extremities are unprotected. Uh, so this provides us a lot more protection. And so when this is positioned properly, we have the patient laying across the uh, table here, in the position of the uh, shields are here with the uh, lead drape laying down onto the patient so that they can move the table and pan as needed without uh, interference. But we get this whole big area of shielded protection for the staff, the physician, and the CV techs, and the RTs, whoever else, circulators. They can work on that side safely um, with equivalent or better radiation protection than the lead 
most of the time it's well above uh, much better than that um, protection of the lead aprons. Um, and then this hair area is unshielded. So any staff working in these areas would have to wear their lead apron and um, most of them will have another shield up here if it's a nurse and that. So we got a good big area of protection. And then this is a different configuration. It's not used as often. So, you know, some of our concerns when we went to the rampart and we use them for most of our cases, there's a few that aren't optimal for the rampart or, um, and sometimes it's, to be honest, it's taken a little bit of time to get some of our physicians to adopt it. But um, we've seen a lot of improvement on that. Um, the adoption of it. Rampart does provide some uh, training sheet on their um, shields. I think they usually post it over here. But one of the things we had concerns with when we first implemented it was our staff for decades, many of them were wearing their, lead, their personal leads with a um, um, radiation dosimeter on their lead. So now they're going into procedures without their leads. So we had to really do some retraining to remind them that they need that radiation dose similar on uh, at all times. So, um, so this here, we've kind of put together at our facility as a reminder and how to set it up and positioning and then what to do in an emergency. But we've had good results. Our uh, staff dosimeters have been really good since we implemented the uh, Rampart and our staff are all feeling uh, well protected and uh, safe. Thanks. I think we'll have a uh, question and answers now. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Steve. And, and if there are anyone who uh, has any questions, I think today is going to bring those to us. I have a few and certainly the panel can uh, can jump <laughs> in and ask questions of Steve as well. But anything from the uh, from the chat room or from the QA? Tania. Yes, sir. We had um, a few questions just on the specifics of zero gravity and what their um, thickness of lead equivalency was, if it was 0.5 or 1.0. <clears throat> so if you look at their IFU, it's both in certain areas. And then just to point out that it's also a single provider solution, not a team solution. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is one millimeter. But yeah, again, it's um, one person. And Kind of both, they have some, the one that we showed is a portable and then they have others that hang from the um, ceiling supports, so. Mm -hmm. Very good, any others? Well, I have uh, Steve, just while we, we've got just a few minutes here, um, what would you think would be like the biggest misconception that people have about ionizing radiation? What do you, what are you kind of seeing in the field? Um, you know, part of it, and I didn't mention, you know, a lot of times the staff, you know, they, they can't see it or fail it. So they don't really have any fear of it until, um, you know, maybe they see a talk like this or read a paper. So sometimes it's, you know, they get a little complacent with mm -hmm. radiation because they don't see it or fail it. And they, you know, and if they get their dosimeter readings, you know, and they may not look at them that often, you know, we post ours every quarter for our staff to review. And then obviously we contact them if anyone has high readings, which um, does happen a lot because the physicians right up close to the patients get pretty high readings, like you said. You know, we're getting close to our annual limits um, in the US as of 5,000 milligrams per year. So, mm -hmm. you know, we get some staff to get up to that. Um, you know, years ago when I started it and as a medical physicist, I went in there to cath lab, we started doing interventional radi um, radiation. And, um, you know, a lot of the docs, they weren't even wearing badges until they started using radiation to radiate the coronaries. You know, they for years were working without it because they weren't concerned with it because they don't see it or fail it, so. We have a few questions that just came in. So one on, can you comment on the appropriate placement of radiation protection pads? Yeah, typically, you know, we don't use them that, we don't use them. I've seen them and um, I think we've tried, a, tried them for a while, but um, we just found some of the other, following our good practices and our drop downs before we got the ramparts were efficient. But, you know, you kind of want it on the side of the body so that as the scatter comes out from the patient, it's got to kind of block that. 
you know, the one issue with those pads are if they're not positioned properly, they can, because they have attenuating material, they'll actually increase the output of the system, which increases everyone's dose and the scatter. So, you know, when used properly, they can, you know, reduce the dose. It's just, um, if it's not positioned right, it's not going to be as effective. They're small and um, you need it in the right position. Okay, follow-up question. Did you say that the physician need not wear their personal lead when using the Rampart system? Correct. Um, you know, and we're based in California and, you know, and I'm not sure of the regs in the other parts of the country or the, you know, over in Europe and that, but we had to, we got an exemption from our state regulators. You know, we presented what the Rampart does and the protection it provides. We got an exemption so that we can two cases without a lead apron. And that's, I think that's happened in a lot of the other states in the US, um, they have those regs in place. So we got that exemption and allows us to do the cases without leads when we use a rampart. Great, there's a few more coming in. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, do we have any disadvantages regarding mm -hmm. procedures that we can do with rampart or can we perform all procedures? Bob, would you like to handle that or would you like mm -hmm. me to? Absolutely. So remember the rampart is a barrier. It's kind of barrier technology rather than personal protection. So it's barrier protection. So you're putting really a wall of uh, protection in front of you and places you in the shadow of that, of that scatter field. So, um, so the procedures you really can't do are the ones where you need to work on the other side or right up underneath the II because that's, that is, you need that uh, kind of shield in front of you. So, uh, so the ones that you're, you're doing directly in the field, uh, rather than an access site that's slightly remote is difficult. So if you're doing a neck procedure, direct neck procedures, um, pacemakers, things like that, where you're really working right up underneath there. I think that's the ones that we're seeing that, um, that, that can't, uh, can't be used with Rampart now. Other access sites, if it's a groin, uh, if it's radial, if it's a uh, pedal approach, um, and, and then working uh, working more proximally or even working down the legs for peripherals, uh, it can be used for that for sure. Awesome, do you have anything to add, Dr. Howell? We have a, an electrophysiologist that's also on panel. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Howell, to that? Uh, no, thank, I think the Bob covered it. So, you know, when you're talking about subclavian access, axillary access, uh, IJ access, uh, the rampart is not going to be adequate to, to cover you. I think, you know, talking to also interventionalists, uh, uh, you can comment, I think epicardi um, epicardial access uh, or pericardial access may be really difficult uh, with positioning of the rampart appropriately to protect you. But Everything from groin access and I think radial access, uh, you you can position and protect yourself quite well. Thank you for that. And we've seen really good success with pedal access, even popliteal and brachial access as well. So um, that, that's been a real gift for us. Another question is, um, and Steve, I'll pitch this to you. Are there any gaps in the rampart where radiation can get through between the lead shields and the middle mast? I've asked, I've been asked this question before and we get asked this question a lot. So I'd like to pitch it to you, Steve, because I have a vivid memory of your Geiger counter being right there. So would you like to answer that question? Yeah, and I, you know, and I think from when we did our first trial with you, um, uh, I don't know, about 16, 18 months ago to the, the systems we have, that center mass lead that I, I kind of showed on the um, one of the slides has been increased in the size. So when positioned properly, that center mass lead will kind of come right up against the uh, skirt, the lead on the table, so that we get pretty good uh, protection there. Um, but that is an area that you do have to make sure it is positioned well. Um, and as the, you know, in Rampart, I've been to many of their training for our facilities, and um, that is, you know, they cover that really well with the staff on positioning. You know, and as the physicians are changing uh, orientation and um, you know, occasionally the II has got to come in and get close to the um, acrylic shield or, or move it a little. So sometimes they do have to reposition it as they um, do the procedure. So you always, you know, it's good to have someone there to kind of keep an eye on it and um, make sure that that gap isn't big. But we've done, like we said, a lot of measurements and we did some measurements, I think, during one of our conferences last fall 
um, kind of measuring there and showing that, you know, we get good protection even with the mask there along the, uh, with the table skirt and the That's mask. a great, that's a great point, Steve. We actually have that video on our website, rampartic.com. And I'm going to kind of lump some of these questions together because they're really flying in on the chat and appreciate you guys so much. <laughs> yeah, give us just um, one more today and then we'll move on. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to loop this one together. Um, it, they're asking about research and supplying data um, that has proven, you know, the dose received to the operator, and and we definitely do have that. But a specific one is: Do you have data on staff have used it for 12 months? Um, the the rampart with um, without lead on their body and the whole body decimeter data, not just race safe data. And you know, I'm so proud that we do because Dr. Howell did his own independent study aside of us getting his own independent badges just for Rampart use and trended that for, I, I can't remember if it was nine months or 12 months, Dr. Howe, but would you be able to speak to that? Because it's not race safe data. It's the data you collected on your own. We we had data uh, uh, data on all our operators for three months and up and then some for up to six months and uh, again clarification you know in EP and we'll talk about this our original dose from the II is is a very low number uh, we're talking much less than 100 milligrams typically uh, and so we have newer we have newer fluoroscopy so it's 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 about the dose that is emanated and then the attenuation of that dose. And so there's a combination of that. And I think, you know, Steve can speak to that about how much is it is attenuated and appropriately attenuated. But uh, what we found is that we had uh, zero uh, exposure on our um, developed badges uh, for the operators that were, again, immediately adjacent, uh, the assisted, and then those who were uh, distant, uh, sort of uh, from the from the um, patient and from the II. So uh, in the appropriate areas, as Steve sort of um, nicely uh, mapped out in that sort of red and uh, green protected areas. So, you know, we, we've had and verified the data and feel very comfortable with it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Bob, I'm gonna push you for just one more because it's important Thanks. to me as a female. We do have a question <clears throat> for pregnant operators. Is this system safe enough to truly ensure no lead? is needed even in this um, special case of pregnancy. Absolutely. So if you look at what um, what you can get during pregnancy, you know, I think I think for us, we um, we want you to be as protected as possible. What could be more protection than being behind a rampart and wearing some abdominal, you know, abdominal skirt as well? Um, you know, we want uh, we obviously want the fetus to get and the baby to get zero. And uh, and I think that's uh, that's certainly achievable uh, with both with with Rampart, with all of the testing that uh, that we do. We're looking at, you know, 99, 98 um, percent or better. And so attenuation and uh, whole body, whole, bo whole body attenuation. And so um, so we really want to get that uh, down to down to background. So is it safe? Absolutely. It, and certainly uh, because of, of the one millimeter lead equivalent, which most people are wearing, you know, the 0.25 um, lead aprons, uh, this certainly gives them a, a great barrier uh, for protection and, and I think would get them back to, to background levels of radiation, which is what we get on every day. Yeah, I would agree that the um, protection is better than you know the typical lead aprons that we're wearing so i think it would be safe yeah great so thanks steve that was awesome and uh we really appreciate it and if you're able to uh, stick around i'm sure there'll be more more comments maybe coming your way uh but we appreciate you taking the taking the time out today uh next we have uh professor spratt professor uh spratt is at saint george university most of y'all uh, probably know him he's really a uh, just a leader in not only education, but in the uh, interventional world and, and CTO world. And, um, and so he is going to, um, he's going to talk to us about, uh, and this is pre-recorded, but we'll get, uh, we'll have some questions afterwards about really mitigating your radiation exposure risk. How can we, number one, understand it, but number two, uh, how can we look to mitigate that based on, based on that understanding? So, uh, so Dr. Spratt. Hello, my name is James Spratt and it's a pleasure to contribute to this uh, webinar on radiation safety. 
I've been made this talk entitled Change is Needed, and I hope to explain why that is the case. If we accept the precept that change is needed, what kind of change is required? Is this purely a behavioral change or is there a structural change in the way that we treat patients? So let's first consider DNA. DNA is the fabric of our world. It maps our world, determines everything that our body responds to, how it responds. But unfortunately, when things go wrong, it can also break our world. Our environment as healthcare professionals is targeted at improving patient outcomes. But is this incurred as a cost to us as physicians? We understand that when we treat patients, we modify risks. We can't always control the future, but we know we can make a better future for our patients if we modify these risks. And as cardiovascular physicians, we know what those risks are. For example, smoking, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and dyslipidemia. As cardiovascular physicians, we can't ignore those risk factors if we did we wouldn't be doing our job. And that behoves the question, what within our environment could be controlled better to reduce the risk to us as healthcare professionals? And the obvious elephant in the room is radiation, specifically ionizing radiation. So let's look at things from a different perspective altogether. Radiation is a major part of our world and the sun is our primary, and some would say, our only source of radiation. Now, it emits a lot of radiation. And you can see that within this spectrum from uh, long waves to short wave radiation, that the sun emits a significant proportion extending from microwaves all the way through to ultraviolet. And actually, in, in some ways, our planet would be completely inhospitable if we were exposed to these, this amount of radiation without some form of protection. But luckily, there is protection in place. And we know it as the ozone layer made famous by the recent focus on that and global warming and so on. But the ozone layer's primary protection is to filter out harmful radiation. And essentially, almost entirely gets rid of UVC, but also most of UVB as well, leaving us only exposed to UVA, which in itself, in excess, can even be a problem. But this ozone layer enables us to live on Earth and it makes Earth habitable. And if we venture outside its protective environments, we know what that risk is. Not only do we have to provide astronauts with oxygen to survive, we have to protect them from these deadly radiation outside the protective environment of the ozone. And you can see the worker on the right is a worker within uh, the nuclear field where the hazard is known and protective measures can be put in place to reduce that to the minimum possible standard. But unfortunately, when it comes to ionizing radiation, we have no inbuilt defense. If you like, the ozone layer has made us um, comfortable evolutionary from not having the protective mechanism in place. We know that if we burn ourselves, if we get near fire, so we, we don't go near fire, we learn that lesson very early in life. But unfortunately, there is no evolved perception with radiation and therefore no reflex to avoid it. We simply don't know it's there and therefore we cannot protect ourselves are our colleagues. And within that context, the use of ionizing radiation for medical procedures is increasing and continues to increase. And you can ask yourself the question, well, why is that the case? What is the utility for ionizing radiation? Why do we rely on it so much? Well, simply put, x-rays visualize structures as impenetrable to visible light. So just like Superman with his x-ray vision, we can see inside uh, patients' bodies and diagnose and guide treatment by using this medical x-ray spectrum. And what we essentially do is we leverage the differential ways that tissues respond to ionizing radiation to get very precise definition 
of structures, in this case a heart. But unfortunately, we may well be paying the price for this incredible utility in that acute exposure of ionizing radiation is associated with DNA damage. And you can see from this experiment with interventional uh, vascular surgeons that when compared to an open procedure that didn't use ionizing radiation, there was a significant acute rise in markers of DNA damage immediately post-procedure. And whilst this improved after 24 hours, there's nevertheless a very daunting um, vision of what damage might be uh, happening internally. But unfortunately, this is not just associated to acute damage. In this study, which compared uh, non-interventional cardiologists to interventional cardiologists, we could see that the markers of DNA damage, that's chronic markers of DNA damage, that's this so-called micronucleus, was seen much more commonly in interventional cardiologists, suggests that things don't go back to normal after that acute exposure and there may be a legacy effect. And the epidemiological information also seems to support this when you look at health risks stratified by occupation you see this consistent effect that the higher the exposure to interventional uh, um, damage due to ionizing radiation, the higher the adverse effects. And in this situation, the blue bar are cardiologists, which are generally work closer to the beam. You can see all these adverse effects, and they're not just the ones you might think of, like cataract formation, but also the very diseases that we work very hard to prevent and treat, such as hypertension and dyslipidemia. And this is stratified according to length of service. So in other words, the more, the longer the time you're in front of this exposure, the increasing the risk. And again, as you can see, as we head towards the blue bars here, with increasing exposure, the increased risks also seen. And these are when compared, so this is excess risk, when compared to um, physicians who did not have exposure to ionizing radiation. So why is this the case? Well, part of this is this cycle of damage and repair. When a cell is exposed to a DNA break, it can either repair or it can fail to repair and produce these so-called senescent or apoptotic cells. And unfortunately, as we age, our immune system becomes progressively less strong. It reacts to the wrong things and it doesn't, it isn't selective in reaction. And that's one of the theories why cancers increase uh, as we get older, but it also may explain why the consequence of the exposure to ionic radiation also increases as we get older. So all this sounds pretty depressing. So as interventional cardiologists and specifically as me, well, what have I learned? Well, like many of my colleagues on this important webinar today, I've learned that going to lots of different coronary labs around the world, that the best way to get the best results for the patients is to control the environment. So we do that by working with people we trust. We do that by measuring ACT regularly to make sure there's no problems with clotting and so on. We familiarize ourselves with the differences in equipment between labs around the world. And ultimately that translates to success for the patients. But I've also realized that we've not been doing that with ourselves. We haven't been controlling the environment that we are exposed to and specifically this radiation environment. And this was brought to mind when I moved to London some years ago that um, one of the wards is dedicated to an interventional cardiologist called Charles Pumphrey, who unfortunately died of a radiation induced cancer. But the lessons weren't learned and the radiation safety really wasn't at the standard that one would expect to see. Now, thankfully, we've turned that corner and we're now got measures in place to protect everyone in the Castor lab, thanks to Rampart and the radiation team that works so assiduously to deliver those standards. But I would say this problem, we can't delegate. It starts with you. It starts with everybody watching this webinar today. And I've just posed a few questions here, which you might wish to consider if you can address like, 
what was your last monthly exposure? What's your annual exposure? And what's your career exposure? All those things are extremely important. And even if you don't know the answers, you can start to find out the answers moving forward because none of us can change the past, but we can modify the future by take, taking the right steps. And some of those right steps are measure the problem, just like any problem. If you don't measure it, you don't understand what risk you are exposed to. And you can not understand if the measures you put in place are sufficient to address those risks. So I would end in conclusion by saying that ionizing radiation is a biological hazard. And even though sometimes it's relatively low dose, this chronic exposure is a hazard to our cells. And there's this biologically plausible mechanism of DNA damage and repair that doesn't quite work out. And the long-term sequelae of this include cancer and ironically, atherosclerosis, which are both of course, diseases of chronic inflammation. The solution to this is gonna take a collective effort of starting with raising awareness. And that means advocacy and that starts with everybody listening to this webinar today. And there are important steps that we should take to reduce backscatter and reducing the risk to the environment and the team. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <clears throat> well, that was uh, that was great. And as you can see, one of the questions that we're going to ask is, you know, are you aware of your current yearly dose? Um, I know quite a few uh, studies that have been done looking at even wearing radiation uh, badges in the cath lab are, are actually fairly dismal, that you would think that they would be worn 100% of the time and people would follow up. But not only are people not even following up on how much radiation they're getting, but, uh, but many people, as many as up to 50 to 60%, are not even even wearing their uh, radiation badges, and that that's not only here in the states, but across the across the world. So it is very important that we uh, that we know uh, not only what is our what is our dose, but but actually wearing wearing our badges. and And I think this uh, this this poll actually uh, actually shows that as well that uh, that most people don't even don't even know. So that that communication with your uh, with your staff uh, and uh, and getting to know what your dose is, you know, you have to ask for it. You know, certainly at my facility, I was not, I was one of those in that, in that uh, group that uh, did not, uh, did not wear my badge because when I did, I overexposed myself uh, many times and then, uh, then realized uh, I didn't want to get kicked out of the lab. So I think that, I think more of that's going on than we think. And so, you know, getting a radiation protection that will allow you comfortably to to wear your badge, know your data, know your numbers, and and be convinced and really enthusiastic that those numbers are small, even after very very uh, complicated uh, complicated cases that seem to be taking uh, longer and longer as we have more uh, more opportunity to do. Um, to do more uh, more procedures and more incredible things uh, percutaneously. Um, the other question that uh, that want to ask, and then we'll field uh, field a question, is that um, that what area of the body concerns you the most in respect to your long term uh, scatter radiation exposure? So if we could bring up that question and just see what everybody's concerned about. And uh, and while we're gathering that information, maybe we can take uh, take some more questions today. So we did have one earlier that we weren't able to get in the last section. Um, and and Steve, you might be a great um, Studerman speaker on this. Do you have any experience with radiation? Do you know anything about that technology? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I've seen it on the website and stuff, but I've haven't been. I haven't seen it in action or um, had a demo on it, but I have seen it. Uh, I think it recently just got approved over here with the. Yes, sir. Anyone? Has anyone has anyone on our panel um, be able to speak to that? That's a no. That's a resounding no. 
-mm. Okay, thank you all. <clears throat> all right. Did the uh, the results pop up? I may have missed them. All right. So, uh, and I do think that that's uh, this is really important. I think we're seeing this consistently that people are concerned about um, the head uh, head area and the brain area. I mean, the brain is a fairly important organ, we think, um, and so I think it is important that we have that total body protection, whatever uh, whatever type of protection that you decide. Uh, you want to get in your lab, you really need to protect uh, the head. There's some pretty good data showing that the um, that uh, the caps, things like that, uh, again, don't really work that well as far as the radiation protection, but also adds more weight on your head and neck, which is probably uh, orthopedically not a very uh, not a very good solution. And um, and same thing with some of the eyewear that's being uh, worn that is it doesn't necessarily. Uh, get you the uh, protected eye protection. So finding a, uh, a solution that protects whole body as well is really, uh, is really ideal. So we're gonna move, uh, we're gonna move on to Dr. Lombardi. Um, you know, it, most everybody knows Dr. Lombardi. He's just, uh, just an expert in our field. And because this is a, uh, on, uh, on safety in the workplace, I think he's really spearheaded with, um, with his podcasts and, and other things that he's got, he's got going on, bringing to us, uh, keeping us all all safe, not only from a radiation orthopedic side, but also uh, the mental distress, the uh, the environment uh, that we work in. So I really appreciate appreciate all that, uh, Dr. Lombardi, and uh, and take it away. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate everybody having me. Uh, I'm going to try to skip through a lot of the slides because a lot of the stuff you know, and I don't want to lose the entire audience here. What I want to talk about is, you know, a lot of the discussion on radiation is great, but the real issue is the lead. And so, you know, Philips and other companies are talking about the reduction radiation dose, and they're scheduling things to reduce radiation dose. And that's great. I understand that we all need to be worried about radiation dose. We all know our cancer is cars. I have an early left cataract from radiation, despite wearing leaded glasses for 10 years to start my career. But the lead is the problem, the lead glasses. The reason I had to stop wearing the lead glasses is because I started to get neck pain because the glasses were so heavy. So these are the things we want to get to. And I'm going to sort of skip through my slides and I want to get to sort of more an impassioned plea to you about what you can do to help yourself. Um, oh, good. There we go. So what's the problem? It's simple. The problem is where we work. We are the most well-paid coal miners in the world. And the canary is all of the people leaving the lab because of back injuries, because of cancers. And we don't take care of any of ourselves because of that. So when we look at things, they've been, that's really slow, but they've done surveys. Two thirds of people worked in radiation. Most of them are recorded musculoskeletal injuries. This is a different practice, Mark Goodwin's. But 15 of the 17 interventionalists and EPs have missed time for back injuries, for hip replacement, knee replacements, back injections. Most of my friends, if you go to an interventional cardiology meeting and you just start randomly asking people, 50% will have had some orthopedic injury compared to 4% of the normal population. Let's see if I can make, oh, okay, there we go. So again, in a survey, well, there we go. Basically, it's a problem. Lots of radiation, we've already talked about that. James covered it in depth. I'm not gonna get crazy about this. Obviously, there are lots of brain cancers. There's lots of left-sided cancers, lots of left radiated things. The radiation cap can help, but when you do that, you're going to increase your neck injury. So do you wanna get a brain tumor? Or do you want to be crippled and look like Jeff Moses who can't hold his neck up because of what goes on in our profession? And again, a lot of what's come up, you know, with the NFL and what they've had to pay because of the concussion and concussion protocols and things. Do your institutions care about you at all? Do you think the people that you work for actually care that you're getting injured to provide them the economic benefit that they get? So there are lots of systems out there. Somebody brought up zero gravity. There's some robotic systems. You do get to wear no lead. 
but the real problem with these, and I was a big believer in Corindus, and I used it because I wanted to get out of lead and I wanted to get away from the radiation. The problem is it did not protect my team. And that becomes the other issue is, this isn't just you in the lab. You have a scrub tech, you have a nurse. In our institution, I have fellows. So all of those people are wearing lead. You know, if you want to talk about your institution, think of the number of people who have to miss work because of back injuries, because they're wearing lead. And so there are workman's comp issues around this. And the other thing for me is because now I have lead protecting my eye and face, I don't have to wear head, heavy lead glasses or a heavy lead hat. So again, everybody's seen the system. It's pretty simple. Is it perfect? No. It takes a little bit of time. When you're doing fluoroscopic uh, guided access using micropuncture technique for femorals, it's a little bit cumbersome. You either have to kind of go in, wear lead, get the access, then step out and rescrub him after they put the rampart in. Same with, radi with the radial. It takes one or two minutes to slide it in. But I will tell you is I'll take three or four minutes of delayed time in the procedure to protect me from wearing lead. And especially since we've already seen turnaround times take forever. So the exit of three to five minutes isn't a big deal. The others until the system hangs from the ceiling and I'm certain someday it will. It, there is some issues with steep angles and moving the eye because it will hit the legs. But again, these are annoyances. Okay, what's a bigger annoyance? I hit the the rampart with the II, or I can't go for a run after work because I've been in lead for 12 hours and I can barely stand up. You tell me. How many of you go home after working in the cath lab emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, and instead of going and doing something healthy because you're emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, you pick up a glass of wine, you go sit down in front of the TV, you get on your Instagram or your Twitter and play on your phone. And it's because you are wrecked by your job. Will you admit that? No way. I am, I'm a God. I'm a savior. I do these amazing heroic procedures. I make my institution lots of money. My staff needs me. My patients need me. That's great. But if you can't do your job, they're not going to be able to have you. And if you're a broken human, you can't do your job. And again, I don't think in the US, anybody's institution cares about them. Most of the purchases of Rampart have not been capital expenses by the healthcare system. They've been foundations donating the money. Now realize if a foundation donates the money, that's not your healthcare system caring about you. That's other people paying an expense for a nonprofit who makes a 10 to 15% EBITDA and is sitting on billions of dollars of capital because they're too cheap to care about you to do simple things to save you. So just like this, there have now started to be lawsuits against healthcare systems because of inadequate radiation protection. Unfortunately, those are ones that have to wait a long time because it's cancer and it has more information because it's cancer. <laughs> but if you have a back injury and you've worked in a cath lab for 20 years, it's because of the lead. And we now have a system that says we shouldn't have to do that. So going forward, if you get a back injury in a cath lab, you should sue your hospital system because they didn't spend a very minimal amount of capital. You know, for CTLPCI in the US, it would be 12 procedures pays for capital, it's actually, that's your contribution margin would pay for a rampart. Again, lots of tumors. Lots of my friends have had these. Lots of people have died by these because of these. I have the uh, left cataract, which is lovely. All of this is additive to radiation. And again, we're doing a lot better with reducing radiation dose, but the lead you have to wear to protect you from these tumors is more detrimental, I think, than a lot of the cancers. Because for me, we got Rampart uh, over a year ago. I wear lead very rarely now. It's either because I can't get Rampart because we're fighting over them because our institution won't buy us more. They bought us one. We had to pay for one out of our own money and they won't buy us more. So we're fighting over them. 
thank you, my institution. But I can now come home after work and go for a run because my back doesn't hurt. I'm back playing golf again. I'm back playing fly fishing again. I quit drinking because I'm not coming home physically and emotionally wrecked. And all I really can do is that. I'm still worried about my left cataract. It's a big deal. But I owe all of that to getting a rampart. And again, I think this is an issue that we're all going to have to deal with. Sorry, my computer's acting up. So one of the things I think everybody here has to be honest, okay? And this is the hardest thing for everybody in our profession. We are not people that demonstrate vulnerability. We are super people, right? Rianne Davies is going to get on here. I can tell you, if I told Rianne Davies she had to run through a three-foot wall to do a CTO, she'd run through a three-foot wall and she wouldn't care if she broke every bone in her body to do it. That's the kind of determination she has. And if they said, Rianne, you need to do three more cases, she's going to do three more cases. She has no idea how to set boundaries for herself because we don't want to look vulnerable that we do have limitations and we do have issues. So first of all, we need to actually look at the vulnerability of ourselves and tell our employers and tell our cath lab directors and stop making excuses about why we're doing the wrong things for ourselves. Second, there is, I mean, if I came out with a therapy that reduced the mortality in MI by 50%, every one of you would be using it in one second. I'm showing you a device that reduces your radiation injury by 700 or 800% and your orthopedic injury by 10X, 10X. We have no data of any other thing in our profession that has a 10X improvement. So why aren't we doing it? Well, it costs money and it's about us, not about patients. Well, guess what? You're gonna be the patient getting a back surgery. I like my orthopedic surgery colleagues, but I'm okay if we reduce their back microdiscectomy surgeries because we're not needing them, okay? Realize your institution does not care about you. Your partners don't care about you. As much as you think your patients, they don't care about you. They care that you're there to take care of them. So stop being bullied. Defend yourself. Protect yourself. Have barriers. I would tell you is take advantage of all modalities to avoid wearing lead radiation exposure. We've done a study of women for, we, I actually got to wear a fetal badge. So did Rianne. Neither of us were planning to get pregnant at the time. But we wore fetal badges and we showed that wearing a lead apron reduces your radiation dose to the fetus to zero. Does Rampart do the same? It's not been tested that way. I don't know, but I can tell you is you could use just your skirt and rampart for the three to six months or the nine months, depending on how, if you know you're getting pregnant and you have just double safety and you're still reducing your orthopedic risk by doing that. The last, I'll put a pitch out for two things. I'm doing a podcast on mental health, physical wellness, and some of the challenges with the culture of our profession. So the website is www.drjourneytobetter.com. I also do it live uh, almost every week on Twitter at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Today, we're going to talk about the toll on innovators in medicine. Bob Foster can tell you about the toll of being an innovator in medicine because he's helped to develop Rampart. And for everybody out there, if you want to talk more about mental health, radiation safety, and other things that really are a challenge in the cardiac cath lab, these topics will also be discussed at the CRF Complications course, July 14th and 15th in Seattle. I want to thank everybody for having me. I'm here to take some questions today if you want me to, or I'll shut up and let Mad Dog take over. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. That was that was really good. And I encourage everybody to go to the podcast. Those are those have really been um long overdue. I'll put it that way. 
that uh, people start seeing just what the what the toll it takes on us mentally and physically and helping this younger generation to to navigate that a lot better than than you and I did. <laughs> yeah, way. exactly. We graduated at the same time. Bob and I made a lot of mistakes trying to learn from them. <laughs> hey, listen, exactly. <laughs> so we just want to share those. Uh, well, that's fantastic. We're going to do uh, this um, this question here. How concerned are you about the orthopedic injuries from wearing the protective lead aprons? And uh, while that comes up, we're not going to take, we're going to skip the um, the audience questions for a minute today. If you'll hold on to those, so we can jump right to Rian. And um, but I do want to kind of kind of address this. You know, know what kind of if you are wearing uh, lead aprons, obviously uh, people are very concerned with it. Uh, there's been multiple studies, and the sad thing is we keep doing study after study after study showing the same thing, yet nobody really came up with any solutions to say, let's, uh, let's change the outcome of some of these studies. But now, now, we've got, uh, now we've got options, and so I really encourage people to, to get out of those lead aprons, because if you can see that, I don't know what the number is here, but really all but 11%, it looks like, um, were, were either moderately or extremely concerned about it. And you should be even early in your practice. Like I say, mine took me out at, in my forties and, and that was really at the peak of my career. That's when I really felt like I had a grasp on, uh, on teaching and, and uh, felt very comfortable in the lab as much as you can in the lab. And, um, and then I was taken out. So, uh, so I encourage everybody to, to look into that. So uh, <clears throat> So if there's uh, any, I, I would say, uh, uh, if there are any specific questions that Dr. Lombardi can uh, can answer, uh, Tanea, before we go to Rianne, we'll maybe take one question here. I'll, I'll be honest, there's not a specific Lombardi question. There's some more physicist questions. You just did such a beautiful, brilliant job, <laughs> Bill, that there's oh, that really... <laughs> there, there's none. I feel like you're just going to get a surge of people registering for the consultation <laughs> course and your podcast is going to go up by 70%. I hope so. Um, for uh, sure. That was fantastic. Thank you so very much. And um, we do have a question um, specific more towards Steve Studerman. So we'll hold that for the end just okay. to be appreciative of everyone's time and, and to keep us on um, schedule. I have the privilege of being able to interview Dr. Davies today. Um, and not that we really need to bring too much awareness to you have two females in this session, but that was our goal with Dr. Davies. Not only is she an accomplished interventional cardiologist with a beautiful career and track record, um, she's also a female operator, which is underrepresented in our, our country. So we wanted to bring her perspective and thank you so much, Dr. Davies, for being here live with us. Thank you for following your mentor, Dr. Lombardi. <laughs> we did that on purpose. <laughs> Um, it's a hard person to follow, I must say. <laughs> it is. Has anyone ever said that Bill was direct? I don't know if anyone has <laughs> doesn't cut cuts right to the no. chase. It's fantastic. No. <laughs> Please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your background. Yeah, so I'm I'm Rianne Davies. I work here at Wellspan in York, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm an interventionalist. I specialize more in the CTO and high risk PCI. Um, but Prior to training with Bill, I spent a lot of time in lead. He introduced me to the robotics, which I found an amazing aspect just because I could step away from the, the table and, and sit down and not wear that heavy lead. So it's been an evolving uh, pattern. And he first had the Rampart. I, I was out of the program by the time he had Rampart. It was shortly after um, he got his that we were able um, to get one here and really have found the benefits of using that. Wonderful. Well, from your perspective as a female operator, knowing that only 4.5% of interventionalists in the United States are female, what do you see as the obstacles or barriers for that? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think along the way, there's a lot of people who maybe deter females from going into the space. I think that is changing. Um, and I think it depends on who you want to listen to when you're going through those times, those critical times where you're making those decisions. But a lot of the reasons you, that are emphasized to you early on is you're going to be exposed to a lot of uh, radiation. You don't want to do that if you want to have a family. You're going to have long call hours or, you know, uh, you got to wear lead and you're a, a, a small female. You don't want to do that. Like, so it, it's easy for people to kind of sway you in the idea of like, oh, no, I, I didn't want to be exposed to lead. And I, I certainly didn't want to be exposed or increase my risk of cancer or have fertility issues and those sorts of things down the road. So 
it is a scary um, part of the field, but, and it's often, I think, a reason that a lot of females step back and think, okay, maybe the non-invasive route would be better for me. And it's unfortunate that that happens. Well, I think those are, yeah, you see Bill doing the two thumbs down. I'm pretty sure you hold the national average of the most female fellows. They're, they yeah. all come out of UW. So we really appreciate yeah. that. And, and to that point, Dr. Davies, how do you think we change that? What can we do? Because you're right. The narrative is one thing and people being in your ear in your program, I think there's just a glass ceiling and being a female in general, no matter what your industry is for that. But how do we specific to interventional cardiology help change that paradigm? I think it's twofold. You know, I think it's up to you as an individual how much you want it. If you if you want to be an interventionist, you'll be an interventionist. And it's a matter of listening to the right people, finding that mentor that's going to support you and help you and give you the answers that are maybe um, better for you or the advice that's better for you. Um, there's a lot of programs out there. I know there's different society programs also that are really encouraging um, females to get into this space. From a high risk base, we just recently had the opportunity to do a high risk PCI course here dedicated to female interventionists, which Rampart was very wonderful in helping us sponsor. And it's just other avenues that are opening up to really encourage females to be in this space. So the doors are there and they're opening. It's just a matter of going through them now. Absolutely. And I, just to expound on that, I think it's the education and awareness, right? So just mm -hmm. buffering some of the rhetoric that's out there and then also talking about the innovation that's now available that wasn't to, you know, the women that pioneered this 15 years ago. Um, and so yeah. really looking at solutions and innovation that make those concerns or that chatter kind of more diminished. And what did your institution do to address your concerns as it related to radiation safety, specifically coming out of a program that was mindful of that? What did your personal mm -hmm. institution do to kind of mitigate that for you? So I was fortunate uh, leaving Bill's lab. I was able to come to a lab where I'd already had robot up and running. Um, and then when Rampart became uh, more common and people started to kind of get it, the word that it was out there, they were willing to give us or to get us a unit, um, you know, pretty quickly um, at, at front. So they were aware of the issues that radiation and orthopedic limitations um, are in the lab. And I think they were initially, you know, um, very much in favor of providing more protection. Uh, we're still only have our single unit here and we're advocating for more units. And, you know, there's, there's always that bit of a, um, discussion or, you know, sometimes those discussions can escalate a little bit, but, you know, we just want to be able to get more in the lab because this rampart really follows me around wherever room I'm in, it's with me. So I feel like a little bit of a hoarder, but they understand too that I want this and it's something that I've asked for from the get-go. So yeah. I think it's just a matter of having those open discussions with your administration. You can try to do that beforehand. I would say if you haven't signed on the dotted line yet, that's the ideal time to maybe start even having those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've done a wonderful job advocating for yourself. And obviously that was a instilled in you very well by a mentor. So good for you and good yes. for him um, for, for doing that. And what specifically about Rampart, Dr. Davies, interests you? I think, you know, I saw a few of the others. The wonderful thing of working with Bill was the opportunity to see different sorts of uh, radiation protection devices as I was there. But this was the first one that really came to light that protected everybody in the room on that side. You know, it's like, for the staff purposes, you don't have to wear your lead if you're on that side of the room. If you go up to the head of the bed, certainly, but we're very mindful of that and cognizant to step off the pedal, they can give their medications and then step back behind protected shielding. Um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of kind of changing the way that you, you run the, the, the way the cases go in, and um, making the right decisions for the patients and yourself. That's brilliant. That's that's wonderful. We're going to take a poll question here on technology use. Has your facility adopted any new technologies or safety measures to address radiation and or orthopedic injury pre uh, prevention? And to kind of piggyback Dr. Davies off of, of what you're saying there, having the opportunity to, to co-sponsor the WIP event that you were kind of speaking to, you know, it was an all women event. Your staff was all female, seeing all of those females out of lead, seeing um, just that collaboration. And you just hit on something that I think is 
a very important part of this discussion was the active communication. Um, when we're mm -hmm. fluoroing, when we're sinning, actually allowing the interventional team to be that, a team yeah. that's cohesive and part of the patient plan and care, not just, I give meds, I do ACT, I scrub, I open wires, but to be part of the procedure, I think that that's globally going to affect not only, you know, better patient outcomes, but but a better buy-in to your institution mm -hmm. and being part of the team. I, I know if I have a family member on the table, I want that person engaged. I don't want them on their cell phone. I don't want them thinking about something else. I want them engaged. And this is a great way to do that. So thank you for your situational awareness and understanding mm -hmm. that you know, when your nurse or tech crosses that maybe you don't need to send a right at that moment. And I think that that's a good confidence and good communication and you foster that and demonstrate it really well. Can you tell us how um, Rampart's changed your practice? I think, you know, it, it's made it's made me a happier person. <laughs> and that I like what Bill was saying, you know, you're not being worn down having what an extra eight to 13, 14 pounds on for every case. And sometimes CTO cases can get long. Sometimes just general cases can get long. So wearing that lead really can put a lot of wear and tear in your neck, your hips, your low back. But that across the board with your techs and your nurses at the table, they're all much happier out of lead. Everybody's happier out of lead, I think. And, you know, um, we chatted about this personally before. Lead for us isn't designed for females. You know, there's a lot of gaps around um, breast tissue and there's just that that cognizant you're aware that you're not fully protected when you're wearing lead you you fool yourself to think oh I have this lead apron on I have this lead top on I'm good to go you're really not and once you start using those sleeves if you don't have a sleeve on both sides you get off balance that can really affect your neck there's just a lot of disadvantages to wearing lead and I think across the board being leadless will just make the team and yourself uh, in a better and happier situation. That's a beautiful pull through. When we did our first IRB and there was some questions about studies. So we did our first IRB at Emory University, a hundred randomized cases, traditional lead compared to Rampart, just looking for equivalency. We badged um, four operators deep or four team members deep, um, seven places on the left side. And the axilla specifically for our female operators in techs was of serious concern for us mm -hmm. as we saw it trending extremely high in traditional lead to the point you just made, Dr. Davies. It's It's got an anatomical and gender bias in traditional lead gowns. They're not made for female anatomical differences. They're not made for, you know, one of the things you just said earlier, you know, some of your peers, well, you're really petite, that lead. I mean, it's, well, yeah, you are. And you're, those ergonomic biases are affected in lead and radiation exposure too. So mm -hmm. um, it's an exciting time with where we are in innovation and solutions for orthopedic injury and radiation safety. It's an exciting time for women in interventional cardiology, for women in interventional lab space. We have owned the lab for the longest. We might not have been the operators, but we've been in the lab the longest. So I, the last question I have for you, and thank you so much for your honesty and your candor but how has this impacted your staff? What have you heard from, you know, you were a robot user, it was kind of a single option, but those exchanges were done by your tech, they're still in lead. So what has your staff said? I, they're, they're thankful. They're definitely thankful. And they're asking me almost on a daily basis when we're getting our next units, because they realize if, if I'm doing the case in a different room, they don't have it in the room that they're in. So you can see um, the want and the desire from the staff across the board that this is something that makes them happy and it's something that's only going to continue to make the team overall in a better space. Well, that's a blessing to hear. We're, we're grateful to partner with you. We're great, grateful for all of the, the feedback you've given us and your partnership. It's been a um, real blessing. So thank you so oh, much, Dr. Davies. Thank you so much for letting me be on here and being on this amazing panel. It's always wonderful being with Bill. <laughs> Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I don't think that we really got any major questions from that, that section. So I'll pitch it back to, to you, Bob. Great. Thanks, Rianne. That was just, uh, thank you. that was so good. Uh, and I tell you, I think that there's a couple things that, um, that are important and, and it is your voice. It's uh, Bill's voice. It's uh, professor Spratt's voice. It's just all these, uh, people that, uh, that are on the podium that people are listening to, at the meetings that that y'all are going to be able to 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 help uh, change this, and uh, and I do think that just with the poll that we just got showing that thirty five percent of the labs that were polled are actually 
uh, doing something about it. And, and I think that's probably a couple of years ago that would have been that would have been near zero. So, so I, you know, I, I think we're beginning to make headway, but we are just at the beginning of this journey, and it's gonna it's gonna be uh, powerhouses like you in in, in the labs um, that are that are saying that uh, that this is part of the procedure, that this is part of of what the environment has to look like, not just could look like, to uh, to protect all of our teams, so that uh, so that you can have a full career of of forty years, like I would have loved. And um, and get on the other side of that and, and be able to hold uh, hold grandbabies and, and you know I can tell you that from experience because I just got to hold our triplets the other day and uh, of course because of my back I could only do one at a time and my lack of number of arms but uh, but you know that that's a joy that uh, that that I think everyone everyone deserves so uh, so thanks again for that. Uh, we're going to move on from the uh, PCI uh, and, uh, and CTO um, uh, cath lab world there and move to some other subspecialties. There's probably people on board that, uh, that are kind of watching this that want to see what about EP, what about structural? So, um, so we've, got, um, we've got Dr. Steve Howe, um, who is going to bring us the, uh, um, the talk from what he's been able to do in the EP world as being uh, someone who is aware of his radiation, uh, wants to reduce his radiation for him and his team, and uh, what procedures that, uh, that he's been able to do and, uh, in the lab and why he, uh, why he thinks is important in the EP world. So, Steve? Great. Thanks, Bob. And Well, uh, again, thank you. Uh, well, hello from San Francisco. Uh, I have been directing the EP lab here uh, at, at Sutter uh, California Pacific Medical Center, as well as medical director of the Carvesco Service Line for Sutter Health in the Bay Area, and have been working for over 30 years, um, you know, doing uh, EP procedures, mainly ablations, uh, generally averaging over 300 a year. And uh, for those who are like physiologists, also uh, cardiologists, EP procedures can be long. I've had lots of my interventional colleagues uh, stop by and, and, you know, ask, you know, are you watching grass grow? Uh, really, actually, you know, the real question is, are we watching the grass mutate as we were doing long procedures with lots of fluoro and lead? And, uh, and I felt the effects, I think, as a lot of the other uh, people uh, you know, uh, panelists here, as well as you as an operator at home. I have cervical crepitus, I have tinnitus, and I knew that, you know, I had uh, an expiration date with respect to how much uh, we could do. And so, you know, I've been looking and thinking about radiation exposure, orthopedic issues with uh, uh, wearing lead for a long time. And so, you know, uh, really, found this technology, found this option, and it's made a big difference. But uh, what I'd like to do is to sort of talk from an EP standpoint, um, concentrating primarily on ablations. You know, what, what have we done? What is available uh, to try and minimize your radiation exposure uh, for the patient, staff, uh, as well as yourself as we move forward? So the, the way uh, I think it's important to understand is that there are a lot of challenges for what we do in the, in the EP lab. A lot of it actually is based on the complexity of the anatomy, maneuvering within the anatomy, making sure that your catheters are um, in the right place and in contact uh, uh, with the right place uh, to be able to deliver the appropriate lesions. Uh, it's also very important to avoid complications, uh, whether it is stroke, a lot of that will have to do with anticoagulation, prevention, overheating, uh, managing air in our lines, uh, and then other uh, issues with collateral damage. Uh, and a lot of this is actually making sure you're, you're in the right place, you're delivering lesions in the right place, and you're also uh, moderating uh, the delivery of your ablative uh, energy uh, to, to not damage the collateral structures, whether it ends up being the, the esophagus, uh, whether it is the phrenic nerve, coronary arteries, uh, et cetera. And so, you know, use of uh, technology, understanding the, the risks are, are crucially important. Obviously, if you have complications, you need to detect them early and manage them. 
and then maximizing efficacy. And efficacy really comes down to understanding the arrhythmia. Uh, number two, making sure that you uh, understand and, and work within the anatomy, and then you deliver lesions that are gonna be durable. And the durability of lesions uh, obviously are, are, are very important. So uh, this is a left atrium of actually a cardiologist in my area that I bladed, a uh, very typical, uh, something that you would see in, in Netter uh, and you would study and, and understand. Again, posterior view, two left veins, two right veins, a small, a normal left atrium. But as, as someone who's done a lot of procedures, um, you, you need to understand that you eventually will see a lot of uh, variability in the anatomy. Uh, here are some examples of a common uh, left common vein that's been inferiorly displaced, uh, as well as a big left common trunk and a right common trunk. And if you were just based purely on where you think things would be, you may be spending a lot of time in the left atrial appendage rather than uh, isolating appropriately the left pulmonary veins uh, or looking for another branch uh, to come out where you typically see the right inferior pulmonary vein, uh, potentially pushing catheters uh, in, in areas that uh, could risk perforation. And so really understand the anatomy is uh, obviously very important. Um, some additional complexity that I've seen over the years, uh, three left pulmonary veins, common inferior uh, uh, trunks uh, of, of the left atrium. Uh, in this one, there are five right pulmonary veins, much more typical of what we would see in the animal lab uh, in, uh, in dogs, um, but uh, we'll also see this uh, variability in humans. And then we also see these alien veins that come off the top, come off the anterior uh, wall of left atrium. And inclusion of these areas that can be arrhythmogenic uh, are very important. And so how do we uh, manage, how do we uh, deal with this complexity of anatomy uh, to make sure that we have a safe, efficacious, uh, and efficient procedure? And so the way we've done this, and I think it's important to understand, is that the use of technology is really where uh, you can manage this complexity. Uh, straightforward anatomy is straightforward, but the complexity uh, you're going to see over your time if you do enough of these procedures. And so use of things like intracardiac echo uh, with an echo probe, typically in the right atrium, gives you real two-dimensional imaging and functional imaging. Uh, Three-dimensional mapping systems like Cardinal Merge or uh, the Abbott Insight system can let you generate intuitive 3D uh, maps um, while, while you're there during the procedure. You can visualize the catheters uh, in the 3D image. And then uh, the putting together um, ultrasound images into a three-dimensional map or now with the development of some 4D uh, echo systems, uh, you can sort of get real-time uh, imaging. Uh, however, uh, the thing about mapping systems, the thing about uh, ultrasound is that it's only incorporated in your map if you put your catheters where um, um, into that chamber. If so, if you don't recognize that there's an accessory vein, if you don't recognize that there are multiple veins, if you're looking in the wrong area, um, it's as if, and your catheter doesn't go there, it's as if it's not there. And that can be the same thing with ultrasound. Um, if you are not uh, visualizing uh, the, the uh, branches or the anatomy of interest, you will not um, know that it's there. If, you, if you're visualizing and you don't recognize it, that also could be an issue. And so using and, and really sort of, I would like to say overlapping these technologies is really important uh, to be able to sort of uh, maneuver in the space and again, these mapping systems, these ultrasound, uh, if used appropriately, can really help you minimize uh, your risk of fluoroscopy by not needing to fluoro when you're in there. But there are times when uh, you still need to use fluoroscopy, in my opinion, uh, to be able to really help do a procedure safely, uh, uh, as well as really be a more efficient. And so obviously one of the, uh, this is something that we commonly see. There's lots of branches in the venous system. Typically we are doing femoral vein access to maneuver. And so being able to um, not push too hard, not uh, perforate uh, venous structures uh, and get a retroperitoneal bleed, bleed uh, I believe fluoroscopy still is the most efficient way uh, to, to be able to manage that. 
Also placement of catheters. Uh, this is uh, placement of catheter in the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus has multiple valves, one at uh, the os, another one that could be um, further uh, towards the middle uh, of the coronary sinus, being able to get these larger catheters coaxial uh, and then through these valves and in a proper position. Again, could be done without fluoroscopy and mapping systems, but you really can't see the anatomy or you can't map the anatomy unless you have the catheters um, already there. Here in an LAO projection, we can see when we cross the septum and when we are coaxial, and then you can sort of clock the catheter around. Again, fluoroscopy can be helpful uh, in doing this efficiently. And then there can be a catheter to lead interaction. So this is uh, putting up um, an S, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a lamp sheath uh, to do a transeptal. Uh, you can get wrapped around the wires. And so being able to maneuver and uh, in this respect, counterclocking around the wires so that you can uh, not pull and tug on them uh, is really important as you get across. Uh, also, you can see here, this is actually uh, an ENSO ETM. We actually cool the esophagus at our program. Uh, to be able to uh, know, to be able to protect the esophagus during uh, radio frequency heating uh, management, understanding where the esophagus is, whether you're using uh, temperature probes or esophageal deviation, uh, fluoroscopy is going to be really important to understand where this is. Also, if you're going to use a cooling system, proper placement of this uh, to cool the esophagus is crucial. Again. Uh, fluoroscopy, uh, I think, is the most efficient way to do that. And then um, maneuvering, you know, in that complex space, uh, you just got to understand the physics of where you are. Uh, if you're going transeptal, there's a fulcrum um, at the transeptal puncture site, um, but you got to transmit the torque. Uh, and so use of the sheath, you can see the sheath is uh, being sort of uh, milked, for lack of a better term, up and down to be able to transmit the force appropriately as we're clocking the lasso from the left side over to the right superior. Uh, you typically, uh, in most systems, can't see the full uh, uh, length of the sheath. And then being able to use those together uh, uh, with a little bit of fluoro uh, can, can help you maneuver uh, in that space. And if you don't uh, use um, fluoro while you're maneuvering, sometimes you can actually uh, push the force such that the sheath is being pushed out away from the septum, um, be able to take a quick look, uh, be able to sort of uh, maneuver, again, your sheath uh, to be able to uh, support your catheter as you're maneuvering uh, in the left atrium or in the left ventricle uh, is uh, um, obviously very important. And then you can have catheter-to-catheter -catheter interaction. Uh, so this is a uh, Example, the lasso grabbing onto the ablation catheter. Um, a quick look with fluoro can allow you to sort of be able to sort of maneuver both catheters and prevent the interactions uh, associated uh, with this, with maneuvering uh, in the space. So I think uh, with the advancements in 3D mapping, intracardiac echo, um, now a potentially 4D echo, really has allowed us to do most of our procedures and most of our maneuvering lesion delivery uh, without use of fluoroscopy. However, uh, there definitely can be times when fluoroscopy is really important uh, to be able, uh, again, to do a safe and efficacious procedure, uh, managing the catheter positioning, catheter lead interactions, catheter catheter interactions, uh, optimizing the guide sheath uh, for a stability, uh, and then uh, just quick touches uh, to make uh, use of fluoro to maneuver efficiently in the complex anatomy. Uh, in my opinion, a fluoroscopy uh, is, is still fundamental to be able to do that well. You also really just need to know what you can trust and what you can't trust. There are certain things you can trust um, with intracardiaco and 3D mapping, but there are times and there are weaknesses when the mapping and the ice are not good. And I, I focused on one which it clearly is if you don't put your catheters there, if you don't visualize it, it's as if it's not there. Uh, the second, obviously, is if there is shifts um, in the map or movement in the map, uh, you really, if you trust the map too much, then you could be uh, in the wrong place, putting lesions in the wrong place. And you seem to need to continue to verify uh, that uh, your technology is 
accurate uh, and in the right place. And so for us, we've been using Rampart IC uh, since 2020, um, and it's really allowed us to get the best of both worlds. Uh, we're able to use uh, minimal fluoro uh, to allow us uh, to be able to uh, verify and, and be additive to our ISIN uh, mapping systems. Uh, and with that, uh, you know, give the patient the safest and the best procedure. But with the Rampart IC, it's got an of lead. Uh, and after, you know, hundreds of cases that we've done, um, you know, it's, it's really uh, protecting myself, my colleagues and the staff, uh, which I think everyone appreciates. I think as what Bill has mentioned, you know, you're not going home uh, completely depleted, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, from just standing for us, you know, it could be 12, 14 hours, depending on the number and, uh, and the complexity of procedures that we do, and likely uh, will prolong my career. Great. Thanks so much, Steve. And I tell you, I think that's the that is the important thing is many times that it's about not the amount of radiation that you're getting. It's just you have to wear the lead aprons for that little bit of, of radiation that you get for the for the whole procedure, uh, because you never know when you're going to use just a little bit of fluoro to be able to uh, to be able to do these efficiently and safely. So so I really, really appreciate that. We're running uh, a good bit behind, so I want to run through um, these last uh, few, and, and these will be real quick, and then we'll, um, and then if if there are some more questions around, we can we can have some questions. But uh, we're really honored to have uh, Dr. Didier Chichi out of um, out of uh, France. He's structural, and uh, he has uh, really been an advocate for uh, for radiation protection in his lab doing his structural cases. So uh, so let's uh, go ahead and roll roll that if we can. Good morning. My name is Didier Cheche. I'm an interventional cardiologist working at Clinique Pasteur in Toulouse, uh, France, and um, uh, the co-head of the structural heart disease uh, department at our uh, institution. Uh, so what we have observed, and uh, it should be the case in the vast majority of the centers we've on site, uh, cardiac surgery is a real growth in the volume of the structural heart disease activities uh, uh, during the past uh, years. And uh, for instance, if we only take a transcatheter aortic valve implantation uh, at our institution, it's, it's, uh, it has uh, exceeded uh, 1,000 procedures uh, per year. And uh, mitral, uh, transcaptor mitral procedures or tricuspid uh, is also is also a growing field, uh, as well as over structural heart disease uh, procedures. So, um, as a consequence, uh, uh, we perform more cases on a daily basis, but uh, as well as with more staff, more uh, people involved in uh, a single procedure. So. Uh, the consequences uh, are first for the patients because we are improving the quality of care, the type of disease that we can treat, the uh, complexity of the risk profile of the patients, so the care has been improved. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, we need to, to find solutions to protect ourselves because doing more cases, more radiations, and potentially more health issues in terms of uh, uh, mus muscular uh, diseases. So uh, back pain has been uh, one of um, uh, one of the issues that uh, our nursing staff has faced. So we are constantly trying to find solutions, ergonomic solutions, to try to prevent uh, this type of issues. So more procedures on a contemporary practice, uh, co contemporary uh, basis, uh, and we need to uh, take this as a reference, uh, trying to improve uh, the quality of care of the patients, but at the same time protecting ourselves radiation-wise and uh, uh, health-wise uh, from a muscular standpoint. Um, we have tried to uh, educate new generation because we are also a training center, a training center for fellows. So we try to uh, make sure that the understand the uh, real importance, the strong importance of uh, radio, uh, radiation safety, X-ray uh, prevention. And uh, this goes through very simple basic uh, stuff like uh, uh, selecting the proper uh, frame rate, uh, 
uh, making sure that the, the patient is really set at the height, uh, the appropriate height on the table that uh, the uh, the shields are properly utilized. Uh, when the to utilize fluorosafe, when the nurse is at the head of the patient to uh, provide care, to avoid to uh, fluoro at that time. And uh, when we do mitral and tricuspid uh, procedures with the echocardiographer, uh, that is uh, echocardiographist that is located at the head on the uh, left uh, part of the uh, the patient, we have um, the the ability the um, ability to utilize a shield, a protective shield dedicated for uh, the uh, echocardiographist that protects, uh, like, let's say. 80% of his body, only leaving room for the TU probe to get uh, on top of that before reaching the, the mouth of the patient. So it's another way to protect our uh, echocardiographies with that mobile shield, uh, body mobile shield uh, on top of the uh, the regular sh shield uh, that we uh, utilize uh, uh, for the upper part of the uh, uh, the head and the, uh, the operator. So uh, this has uh, become uh, really uh, central, and I do believe that there is a need to educate the medical community and, uh, in general and the cardiology uh, community in particular, because we uh, maybe that's something that we forgot, and it's uh, very important. It's uh, a crucial point for the new generation. Um, as part of the solutions that we, uh, we have implemented at our institution is a rampart. And I have to say that this has um, clearly changed my practice in the sense that I've seen a dramatic reduction of the doses that I could uh, uh, get in return of the, uh, the, the procedures for, for the patient. And uh, for a TAVI, mitral, and tricuspid, it's a very an added, it's a really an added value because you can uh, utilize any type of angle that you want for this type of procedures. Uh, you don't move that much the, the table, so you can pre-select the angles, you can set uh, the uh, the ramper, put the ramper in place, and you don't need to mobilize it too much during the procedure. So as a consequence, what I've, uh, I'm doing more and more is to uh, uh, perform the procedures without any lead. And this, as I said earlier, uh, in terms of uh, back pain prevention, muscular uh, uh, pain prevention, muscular disease prevention is really key. If we can do lead-free procedures, definitely this is going to be a game changer in the in the in the in the future. On top of decreasing further more the uh, radiation for the uh, for the team, the operators and the team in in general. It's really uh, key to prevent uh, health issues, uh, muscular uh, issues, back pain, shoulders, neck uh, pain. So it's very uh, important. Let's see how in the future uh, people are going to adopt that technology. It, it is already the case at our institu institution for our structural health disease uh, procedures. So um, uh, unfortunately, I can't be here physically with you, uh, but I... Thank you for inviting me and wish you all the best for uh, this uh, roundtable discussion. Bye-bye. <clears throat> well, great. Really appreciate, uh, really appreciate that. And, and as most of you have seen, looked in in a structural procedure and just see the total number of people in those rooms and, and having all of those people um, that are on the, um, that are on this side, the table side and the operator side of the, um, of the table it, being out of being out of lead aprons is really a um, a neat thing to see. Um, we did look at uh, just how many of you have had to take some time off, and that's one of the things that our next speaker is going to speak on. Is you know a significant number of people are now having to take time off, uh, either completely or reduced workload, and so the. Uh, ROI on getting a device that allows you to come out of the wet apron to protect your back, I think is very, uh, very important. So um, now we're going to go to a couple of short uh, videos, basically uh, getting the perspective of the team and the cath lab managers and, um, and, um, and getting their perspective. And a lot of this has to do with the morale, with uh, staffing, with retention and with recruitment. If your hospital is um, and you are, are taking the lead 
on your radiation protection, orthopedic protection, or protecting your team, then people will more likely uh, not only physically be able to stay in, uh, stay in the procedures longer and, and stay in your hospital longer, but hopefully help recruit uh, new people, especially for their competitor across, across town or in the next town that, uh, that only has the lead apron option. So, so with that, uh, Dave Stralo is going to uh, talk to us about um, just about uh, that and that perspective of the cath lab manager. Hello, everyone. My name is Dave Stralo, and I'm the director of cardiovascular business operations here at St. Luke's Mid America Heart Institute in Kansas City, Missouri. Prior to this role, I was the director of cardiovascular laboratory services, also here at St. Luke's, and I've been doing that since 1981. We are a multi-hospital CV laboratory service performing over 7,000 procedures annually. I've been fortunate throughout my career to have been exposed to, and in some cases, had a role in many major cardiovascular breakthroughs in the CV and EP labs. And for the majority of these cases, ionizing radiation was an undesired but necessary component. We all know ionizing radiation is harmful to your body, and since my early days at the Mayo Clinic Cardiac Cath Labs, we have strived to use as little dose as possible, but have never been able to work in a cath lab without wearing a lead apron. I've also been in cardiology long enough to have seen the effects of lead aprons on bodies. In my operations alone, I know good doctors and good nurses and techs who have had to change or shorten their careers due to back pain or injury. Because of this, and in my role as director, I've always explored the benefits of new X-ray protective systems as they are introduced. I've evaluated ceiling-mounted individual personal barriers, uh, counterweighted ballast X-ray aprons, and specialized beaded segmental curtains, to name a few. Evaluations most often resulted in a likely adoption by anyone with back problems, but too many undesirable characteristics to be fully adopted and consistently used by most operators and the cost was too high to embrace adoption of the technology. That said, I've been adding a line item to my capital budget year over year for a system like this so I could buy it when the right technology was introduced. Recently, I learned of the Rampart system and skeptically, I considered it for evaluation, but knew it would likely fall below my expectations and result in the same outcome of previous reviews. Fortunately for my organization, one of our physicians was able to use a Rampart system while proctoring cardiologists at another hospital. He came back to Kansas City with all the information I needed to proceed with an on-site evaluation, and the rest of the story is now we use Rampart systems. After the evaluation, the benefits were really self-evident. It does protect everyone in the room from ionizing radiation, both the doctors and all the staff that support them. You can operate without wearing lead. It is not so cumbersome as to become a hindrance to delivering high-quality care. Staff can easily move the system in and out as needed. All operators use it for all types of cases. Cases with Rampart have become the standard operating mode, not just the exception for the person with back pain or the long case with an expected high exposure rate. And our Radiation Safety Officer and Radiation Safety Committee have endorsed its use as safe and effective. We now use Rampart systems in four rooms here at St. Louis Health System, but acquisition of this technology has been a little challenging. As I've already stated, I had budgeted for one unit in my capital budget as the price of a Rampart system exceeded my capital equipment purchase threshold. My surprise was at how disruptive this technology really was. A disruptive technology in healthcare is an innovation that significantly alters the way we operate. It benefits all of the staff in a room where it's located, but none of the staff where it is missing. We desire to have more units, but nothing in the budget to purchase them. Therefore, we look to our foundation and philanthropic sources of funding. We identified a donor, and they easily recognized the value of their donation would have on the caregivers they were honoring with their donation. Safely using ionizing radiation has always been a priority and we still must not overlook the harmful consequences of it to the patients and staff. But now, we can proudly acknowledge that we have improved the working conditions for our staff to eliminate their extra exposure and physical stress from wearing lead 
whenever they work in a room equipped with Rampart. Well, fantastic. So we have, we're going to have, uh, and that kind of gives you that perspective of the manager. Um, we're going to have just a, a one minute quick video from Chris Armbruster, who's from La Jolla, San Diego. He's a uh, radiation tech there. And, um, and let's see what he has to say. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm a cardiovascular technologist. I work in Scripps, La Jolla in San Diego, California. Been in the lab for a little over three years now. Uh, what does Rampart mean to me? Honestly, it, it means everything. It's a game changer. It's a lifesaver. Uh, being newer in the lab, I can already feel the effects that lead has on the back, being sore and tired at the end of the day. Uh, this thing, it's simple to use. It's easy to move. It takes a few extra seconds to drape. And then once you get used to that, it's all just part of the routine. Uh, we have five in our lab, and we use them for every type of case, right radio, left radio, I mean, groin, CTO, it's amazing, structural. I mean, from an orthopedic standpoint, it's no brainer. It's so nice being scrubbed in all day without having to wear lead. You actually have energy at the end of the day to go do things. Um, from a radiation standpoint, I mean, it was fascinating being able to see the live numbers that they had on their badges of what we were getting with lead on, as opposed to being leadless behind the rampart wall. Um, I fully support this device, and I really think every single lab should have it. As I think all of y'all could see, you know, that was the consensus as well, that if you had something in there, would you use it and uh, something that you knew that you were safe behind. And, and, I, and I will say that that's one of the um, one of the really purposes and the pushes of, of Rampart as a company is not only education, but we're data driven. We want to make sure that it is it is safe for you. And, you know, just for me, for me to walk in there and to be able to take off my lead. Um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, that the data supports it, that you're comfortable in the lab. And uh, and that's why whenever there are launches, evaluations, et cetera, that um, that there's some real time dosimetry letting you know what you're actually uh, letting you know what you're actually getting. But after doing uh, thousands of these, um, you know, we're really seeing some phenomenal uh, data that just allows people to comfortably come out of their come out of their lead apron. So with that, you know, I'd really like to open it up to some questions. I know we're, we're running behind. I appreciate everybody, everybody staying. But uh, those who are, uh, those who have stayed uh, today, are there some questions that we really need to address with the panel here? You know, <clears throat> there are, Bob. Thank you so much. So we just had one come up that says regulatory agencies tend to be slow in recognizing new technology. How has the regulatory community accepted this system, i.e. allowed licensures and reduced lead um, apron use, and and I'll I'll take just the beginning part of that um, because speaking for the U.S., I know we have a very broad a global audience here with us today, but speaking from a U.S. kind of regulatory perspective. Um, there's not an official federal governing body of this. It's very state dependent. Radiation safety and radiation law is held within each state through the Department of Public or Community Health. So that's why there's great variability um, in each different region and each different state. But to date, we have not had a single state within the United States deny um, any kind of variance or any kind of ability or obstruction to remove lead from the body. So we're very proud of that. And I, I really can't speak to that on the OUS front, but I think that maybe Shauna would be a great person um, to discuss that. Yeah, so I would say it really depends on the country. Uh, we have uh, a number of lead-free countries OUS now, which is fantastic. How we got there was really a combination of going to regulatory boards, working with local physicists, finding out what we needed to um, to get to prove for um, the decision to be made that people can be led free. So it does vary, but it's something that we can definitely uh, work on in each country. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Sean. And I would just echo that here in the States as well, to her point, we bring in the RSO and the physicist, they're a part of our process. And that's super important as that's their domain. And so we want their confidence thresholds to be brought in as well with your own independent um, verifications. I think that's very important for confidence thresholds past IRB and peer review, but within your own institution with your mechanisms of operation. Thanks for that. 
we had another question um, from the from the group asking about appropriately using rad pads, which I kind of feel like Steve Suderman talked through that a little bit earlier. Maybe that person wasn't on, but also followed up with a question of, could we recommend um, aprons? What aprons do we recommend? And I chuckled. I think it's a beautiful question, but I haven't worn an apron in um, over two and a half years. So I would be a really poor resource to answer that question because I don't wear lead. Um, does anybody on the panel have a recommendation I, I, to, uh, for that question? Yeah, don't don't wear lead. <clears throat> yeah, that's hard to answer this, you know, this yeah, I know in the U.S. is you know several vendors. It's kind of personal preference. Um, you know, we try and recommend 0.5 but uh, millimeter, but you know we can go as low as 0.25 millimeters by our state regulations. So um, it's kind of based on what you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, the, I think the, it, problem with, the problem with the 0.5 is it's so heavy. It is. It gets, but, that's that's a really it's tough to wear for any length of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, for us, we, most of our, a lot of our physicians and staff have gone to the 0.35 and the, you know, the attenuation protection difference isn't that great and the weight is a benefit. So, you know, they're really heavy after a while. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate I just, that. Tania, I, I just want to make sure um, we're answering the question properly, but if you're going to use Rampart, the under table lead apron is extremely important that it, it's crucial to have the, the under table uh, lead so um, or apron. So I just want to make sure that that's uh, clear. Yes, sir. And you know, Steve, you were one of our very first, I got to pay homage to him. He was one of our very first adopters. So at that time, we were not comboing that together. And now we do. So um, under table lead is a part of the Rampart system that comes and you make a very valid point. So you have to have both pieces, right? The under table lead abdominal protectors and the Rampart to fully come out of lead. So that's a great point. Thank you so much. And if you don't, you can't. So that's, um, we're very transparent. We're good at what we're good at. And we try to be data driven and, and led with, lead with that integrity. So thank you for validating that. Bob, I think we have one more last poll. I don't have any other questions remaining. So we I would just say back on that last question that, you know, some of the data says that that if you, you know, if your lead feels heavy, it's probably the one that's protecting you. If it feels light, you know, you're sacrificing some uh, some radiation protection. And keep in mind that, that even with a lead apron, 30% of your body is not protected at all. So, you know, that's one of the things we strive for when we talk about whole body radiation protection. It's not only team radiation protection, but also whole body that we go from the top of your head all the way down. And uh, because there's a lot of important, uh, important organs there, not to mention the big hole in the side of the lead apron that's normally facing your eye eye where the radiation is coming in. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so the last question is, uh, after this webinar, do you plan to take steps to mitigate um, risk for radiation or orthopedic strain in your healthcare institutions? And, and I think this is the, this is the big uh, gorilla in the room is, 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 yeah, we hear about it. Yeah, we understand it. Are we going to go right back to standard practices or are we going to push? And, and, it, and it does require push. Uh, at many levels, you know, we find as we enter lab, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's it's rarely the the physicians, the operators, but sometimes there are. Sometimes there's resistance there. People say, "Well, I've worn my lead all this time," um, and uh, and so I actually had uh, someone last week who said, "I just wanted to wear my lead once because I've been asking for it for about three months, and I finally got it. Finally got some new lead." And now you bring this in, I don't have to wear lead anymore. So he said, I, I need to at least wear it once because they just got it for me. So uh, so I do think it's it's taking that next step to really put your, you know, dig your heels in and say, I'm going to do what it takes to get me and my team protected. And I would just piggyback off of that, Bob, and say that we're so grateful to partner at the institutional level with the teams in all of the different interventional suites that we're able to partner with. And we're also really, really grateful for for what is the innovation of Rampart, the, the actual equipment itself, the technology behind it, and then what the team brings in training and education. That's a big part of the performa of Rampart, understanding 
um, all of the things that we've talked about today. Um, so education and awareness is how paradigms are changed and standards are changed. And we're really grateful to be a part of that movement. And thank you to everybody who has participated in this and given us just great voices here. We appreciate your time and look forward to uh, really just changing changing the way uh, labs function in the future and, and protecting this uh, the current generation and the next generation to be able to provide the care. And thank you all. I know it was I know it was a uh, a um, time away from your busy schedules and 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 we'll we'll continue to to uh, promote this education and and just see see where it goes. We're we're excited about it.